Greetings to all. Welcome to the Holocaust Memorial Resource and Education Center of Florida's Teacher Professional Development event with Greg Dawson. The date is April 26, 2020, and my name is Mitch Bloomer. I'm the resource teacher at the Holocaust Center, and I welcome you to this event. Now, for all the teachers, I want to point out that the state of Florida defines the Holocaust as you see on the screen the systematic planned annihilation of European Jews and other groups by Nazi Germany from 1933 to 1945. Most people, when they think about the Holocaust, think only about the mass murder of Jews that took place between 1941 and 1945, but it must be obvious that many things had to happen before the killings began to prepare for such a dreadful event. And so it's possible for us to think about the Holocaust as if it actually unfolded through four sequential stages. In the earliest days, before Nazi Germany had extended its control over any other territory, their first step towards dis this destruction of the Jews was simply to segregate them within Germany denying them their rightful place in society and diminishing their influence within the body of the German nation and culture. So this first phase actually um, sought to redefine Jews in Germany as non-Germans. And we should point out, of course, that the Jews of Germany were Germans. They were German by citizenship, by language, by culture, by heritage, and this first phase, Nazi Germany sought to remove Jewish influence from the body of the rest of the German people. And they would work very hard at this for the first three and a half years, and they never really stopped. Uh, but as they became more powerful, they increased the pressure to try to get the Jews to leave. Uh, to force them to emigrate. Now, this emigration between 1937 and 1939 uh, would still take place to a destination of individual Jewish people and families' own choosing, um, and to a degree, at a time of their own choosing, uh, the Nazis were simply increasing pressure uh, to make it more and more likely that Jews would leave. Now, they, they really couldn't do more because they couldn't force other countries to take Jews in. Not until the beginning of World War II. The third phase begins when Germany invaded Poland at, at the beginning of September 1939. At that point, they have a place where they can send Jews against their will. So the third phase of the Holocaust is to expel Jews into territory of Germany's choosing. Now, they would do this uh, at first into the territory they occupied just to the east of Germany, but they hoped probably and ultimately to remove Jews to some destination in the world even farther away. Uh, now this phase would continue until a dramatic increase in the intensity of the war that came when Germany attacked the Soviet Union further to the east. And the attack against the Soviet Union is really the, the decisive phase of World War II. It begins on June 22nd, 1941. And I wanted to just set the stage for today's workshop to say that the entirety of the story shared by Greg Dawson about what happened to his mother, Jana, and her family, his parent, his grandparents, his aunt, all take place in this fourth stage. Now I'd like to share with you, just for your own thoughts, uh, some perspective from the side of the perpetrators. Greg's story obviously is going to talk about the Holocaust from the perspective of its targeted victims. And that's a very, very important perspective to take. In fact, probably the main one that we take while we teach about the Holocaust. Um, but the perpetrators are the ones who actually make all these events happen. And it's very important what they're thinking. And I think one thing that, that often gets ignored in Holocaust education is that teachers don't necessarily take into account the fact that the German perpetrators themselves had to experience some changes within their own thinking uh, that led them to the position where they were finally 
and ultimately willing to commit genocidal mass murder. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to share with you two quotes, both from the same man, Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, um, and they're separated by about three years. So in this first quote, notice that Heinrich Himmler is, is writing to Adolf Hitler in a secret memo. And it's important to note then that this is a secret memo. It's not uh, a public statement designed for propaganda to fool anybody about Nazi Germany's ultimate intentions. Uh, but speaking of, of what the Nazis refer to as their Jewish problem, Himmler says that the solution lies in getting the Jews out of Europe. Uh, getting them to some other location and at this moment he's thinking about uh, the island of Madagascar off the coast of Africa but there were various plans that that kind of represented a territorial solution to the Nazis self-defined and self-imposed Jewish problem and note that he says cruel and tragic as every individual case may be this method is the mildest and best if out of inner conviction we reject the Bolshevist method of physical destruction of a people as un-Germanic and impossible. So in Himmler's thinking, the idea of killing the Jews as a solution to the Jewish problem, that is mass killing and genocidal mass murder, is not only not possible, but it's un-Germanic. Note that three years later, in a speech that he's giving to SS higher leaders uh, in Poznan in October of 1943, um, he makes this statement. Uh, I should clarify, two days earlier he had given a speech where he talked openly and directly about Germany's engagement in the physical, what he said, extermination of the Jewish people and claimed that all Nazis understood that it was the right thing to do um, but that the SS men were the only ones who had actually had to do it and were hardened um, enough to, to carry out the deed. Uh, apparently between October 4th and October 6th someone came to him and asked him why was it necessary to kill the women and the children and this is his response. We came to the question how is it with the women and children? I decided to find a clear solution here as well. I did not consider myself justified to exterminate the men, that is to kill them or have them killed, and allow the avengers of our sons and grandsons in the form of their children to grow up. The difficult decision had to be taken to make this people disappear from the earth. So at some point, or at, at a development of many points between those two dates, May of 1940 and October of 1943, the Nazis became comfortable with the idea that they could solve their Jewish problem with genocidal mass murder. This is a remarkable development and yet we see it as being the type of development that happens probably in every genocide. Now the impetus for the beginning of this change was the German invasion of the Soviet Union uh, which the Nazis referred to as Operation Barbarossa and here's a, a map that shows you in very simple terms uh, the direction of the German army the Wehrmacht into the Soviet Union uh, Army Group A or Army Group North rather heading for Leningrad Army Group Center for Moscow and Army Group South to Stalingrad behind the front lines of that operation also came mobile operations forces special operations groups known as Einsatzgruppen and these become the mobile killing squads of the Holocaust by bullets the first phase of the destruction of the genocidal mass murder of European Jews uh, now these are made up of, of SS detachments but also supported by occupation police order police uh, sometimes um, men from the Wehrmacht, uh, many times voluntarily uh, coming over from the Wehrmacht, and local forces, auxiliary forces um, of the indigenous population. Um, now I do want to point out that uh, that we can't lay the blame for this killing entirely at the feet of the local population, but there were people in the local population, and sometimes quite a few, 
who were willing to collaborate in this endeavor. Uh, one thing I would like to, to point out to all teachers is that you might want to look up a book called Holocaust by Bullets by Father, Father Patrick Dubois, uh, who leads an organization known as Yahad in Unum. And um, he has spent the last almost 20 years uh, researching the killings of the uh, carried out by the Einsatzgruppen and, and, and their collaborators in Eastern Europe and, and quite a bit in Ukraine uh, over the course of um, the Holocaust uh, in the in its first stage. Uh, so Yahad in Unum uh, has a website and if you want to just look that up on the internet uh, you'll learn quite a bit and the book Holocaust by Bullets is available from Amazon. I think you should probably check it out. Now here I'm showing you a map that, that shows you greater detail. Uh, and if you look at the, the gray part of the map on the left hand side, you'll see uh, there was a, a large center of central Poland that during the occupation the Nazis referred to as the general government. And if you draw a, a straight line to the right, uh, you'll see that you pass through the city of Kiev. And Kiev was the location where Einsatzgruppe C carried out the single largest mass killing in the entire history of the Holocaust. Uh, the massacre, the, the, the murder of the Jews of, of uh, Kiev at the ravine of Babi Yar, just outside the city, on September 29th and 30th, 1941. Uh, but if you extend the line further to the east, you come straight to a city called Kharkov, uh, sometimes also referred to as Haikov, and um, and that's the story, or that's the place where Greg's mother and her family lived uh, at the time of the German invasion. And um, the Germans make it to to Haikov, uh, not that long after they've they've rolled through Kiev, uh, and the the terrible massacre of Jews in, in Kharkov takes place at a location known as Drobitsky Yar. It was the fact that Greg's mom escaped from the trek to this massacre uh, that allowed for this story to take place. So Greg will share the story of his mom Jana, Jana, I'm sorry, his mom Jana, uh, her sister Frina, and, and how they managed to escape from this massacre, uh, and and um, the the incredible story of their survival uh, in our session today. And all the teachers who complete the requirements of of this PD will also receive a copy of Greg's book hiding in the spotlight. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce to everyone our, our keynote presenter and speaker today, Greg Dawson. Excellent uh, introduction in his history of the uh, history of the Holocaust in, uh, in, in Eastern Ukraine is that even today, um, even today, many of the almost virtually all the places that he mentioned, he mentioned a couple, uh, the most notable is the, the largest killing field in Ukraine, uh, uh, Babi Yar. Uh, even that today uh, would probably, if, I had, if you did a survey of 100 people in this country, probably I'm guessing even like 90% would, would be familiar with the, with the names Auschwitz and Dachau. I, I still, I still, I seriously doubt that you could get 10 to 20 percent who could tell you what Babi Yar was. And, um, and so that's really, that really uh, segues to one of my main um, uh, findings when I started doing the research for this, for this book. Keep in mind that, you know, I'm 70 now, uh, went to school in the 50s and the 60s, and, um, and when I was growing up, didn't know anything about this story from my mother. We can talk about that later, uh, but I grew up not knowing my, my, own, my family's history and that, that part of it. And, um, and also we just weren't taught much about the Holocaust when I was in grade school and in uh, you know, junior high and high school in Bloomington, Indiana. And uh, matter of fact, I don't remember being taught anything per se about the Holocaust. You know, parenthetically, one interesting thing I, I ran into in my research for a follow-up book uh, called Judgment in the, in, uh, Judgment before Nuremberg, which is, which is more a history, deeper history of the Holocaust in Ukraine and the first trial of the Nazis uh, for their crimes. Uh, 
is that it's just how late uh, this country came to awareness of the Holocaust by that name. Uh, the New York Times did not use that uh, term in its pages until 1959, which I found very, very surprising. And so I grew up, like most people in my generation, knowing really almost nothing about the Holocaust except a few names, a Diary of Anne Frank, uh, just a few names. And it, I know in our history classes, I think in, you know, when I was in secondary school, you know, the history of World War, World War II was pretty much Pearl Harbor and Normandy. And there was some, as I recall, some generalized references to how the Germans had persecuted and killed a lot of Jews, but there was no, it was not the focal point at, at any point in, in the history we were taught. And the word Holocaust didn't exist then. So, uh, so when I got to the point where I started doing research for this, for the first, for hiding in the spotlight around the year 2000, um, everything I was learning was a, it was, it's a big learning experience for me. And again, this is 2000, so it was 20 years ago, but still, um, uh, it, it, and so I, a big uh, revelation for me was uh, everything I was learning is really a revelation to me in terms of the Holocaust and of course my mother's story. But then after the book came out and started talking to groups, realized that, that most of us in this country were in the same boat and knew very, very little about the Holocaust and especially the part of it that comes back to this film and to the, the chart that, that showed about the invasion, a Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, these mobile killing squads, the Einsatzgruppen, which followed the regular German army on its march across Ukraine. Um, the German army's goal, of course, was to go across Ukraine and get to Stalingrad and take Stalingrad. And at the same time, they were attempting to take Moscow. Well, they went 0 for 2 on that, as you know. Um, they, like Napoleon, they never made it to Moscow. And they made it to Stalingrad, but with disastrous results. Uh, that war lasted for, I think it's like 700 days or something. And, and the, the, Russians, the Russians lost more soldiers at Stalingrad, defending Stalingrad, than the, than the United States lost in the entire war. And um, this part of the World War II history is so little known in this country still. Um, and the, the description that Mitch was giving of the Einsatzgruppen and of these mobile killing squads, the, uh, the upwards, as a result of those actions, upwards of a million uh, Jews were murdered by the Nazis even before any of the, the uh, death camps that we know so well by name, by Auschwitz and Dachau and Treblinka. And, uh, those didn't even start operating until the spring of 1942. So really the opening chapter, uh, meaningful opening chapter of the Holocaust as we know it, meaning the systematic extermination of Jews, not just, not just the imprisonment of it, which began, Jews were being imprisoned uh, and, and killed uh, just in, in Poland in 1939, for example, but it was not a systematic extermination. That did not really begin until that invasion in 1941. And, and, and it was so awful uh, the manner in which they were murdering the Jews in Ukraine was so, was so awful that it started to take a terrible toll um, on the German soldiers who were called on to execute all these hundreds of thousands of people to the, to the point that the German high command, the generals were getting back in touch with high command in Berlin and saying, you know, we have to find another way. My man can't do this after doing this for a couple of days or weeks you know, they're, they're getting that version of like PTSD because they were just basically shooting men and, uh, men and especially women and children all day long and throwing them in pits. And even though they were recruits of the German army and they were soldiers, they were human beings. And at some point those instincts kicked in and they, it, was not, it was just not tenable, it wasn't sustainable. So that, that also served the purpose of hastening the opening, the construction and the openings of the death camps like Auschwitz, which were deemed to be a much more efficient way of eliminating Jews. And in fact, it was than the manner in Ukraine. But, but this whole chapter of what happened in Ukraine was certainly news to me completely when I started doing my research. And it's still largely untold uh, in, uh, and uh, undiscussed and unknown in this country. And that's, that's going to take time. By the way, the Soviet Union um, is kind of complicit in that, in a way, 
uh, we can talk about that later if we want to, but it was a, it was kind of a double cover up. First of all, the Nazis tried to cover up their crimes in Ukraine as they were, as they were retreating after being defeated in Stalingrad on their way back to Germany West. They stopped along the way and actually tried to dig up all the German corpses, I mean, and the Jewish corpses, and burn them to, in other words, burn or destroy all the evidence. It was a macabre, impossible task, but they actually tried and, of course, failed at that. Um, so uh, this is the deeper, even broader context for, uh, for, my, uh, for, for my mother's story and also points up how truly miraculous it was that she she was able to able to survive. The, there are very very few uh, Ukra uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, Holocaust survivors in this country for good reasons because the German army was particularly uh, was particularly efficient in the early in, in murdering them in the early days of of the war in 1941 and 42 because the Red Army was in disarray and uh, the country was basically defenseless. Um, the Nazis did things in the Ukraine and Eastern Europe that they did not do in Western Europe the, in terms of atrocities um, because they, they clearly deemed or considered the Slavs and the Russians as a, as a secondary race, as a sub race, as a race that were not much, were much, not much different from, you know, infestations of rats and, and cockroaches. And that's how they regarded them fit for fit for um, you know uh, systematic uh, extermination because the Germans last thing I'll say before we move on the Germans actually their their goal was to was to, was to cleanse they would say cleanse uh, the Ukraine and Eastern Europe of the Jews and the Slavs so it could be colonized by the by the Germans and Hitler by the way um, uh, uh, took as, as some of his um, he learned he said by studying the American American history and seeing how uh, seeing how the white men had actually cleared a lot of land, as you all know, had cleared a lot of land of the Native Americans to do just that to colonize it. Um, don't want to be too loose with the analogy, uh, but uh, but in any case, that's what the Germans did, and they made a couple of feeble attempts. Uh, one that I recounted in the Judgment Before Nuremberg book, the follow up. In which I actually did establish a couple of communities in the in the cleaned out areas of, of Ukraine, Eastern Europe, didn't work. Uh, but uh, that was their intention, as Mitch said, the intention from 1933, 1945. Yes, all along, even before they started the systematic extermination, that was clearly their intent. And there are countless examples and quotes, and Mitch picked really good ones. Uh, particularly the one from Himmler, in which he made the point that they were not just fighting another army. You know, we think in terms of the United States Army you know, defeating the German army or the Japanese army, but but their goal, quite specifically, was to was to murder the women and the children to prevent, you know, to prevent the Jews from uh, from continuing its uh, uh, their civilization. So um, uh, all of this has been a big learning experience for me. I certainly did more work and more research doing these books than I ever did in high school or in college, as my teachers would tell you. Um, so there's nothing like, uh, you know, on the job training. So, um, so anyway, that's just some thoughts I had uh, to, and to, in addition to what, in addition to uh, uh, Mitch's excellent uh, uh, introduction. So uh, gosh, there's so much more we can go into, but I think you've heard quite enough from me from now. And I'd like to, uh, Mitch, if you have anything you would like to add to what I said, or if anyone there has any, um, any, if this is a point of departure for anybody's questions or thoughts, I really welcome that because that's, I always find that more interesting than hearing, hearing myself talk. <laughs> so. Well, Greg, we're, we're certainly very, very happy to be hearing you talk, and we want to hear a lot more of what you have to say. Uh, but at this point, I want to say to the teachers, um, I, I might be wrong about this, uh, but I believe that if everybody leaves themselves muted, um, then if, uh, if you want to unmute yourself just individually on the uh, very left-hand side of the screen at the bottom, you should have a little toolbar and you can, you can unmute yourself uh, and ask a question.
um, we'll, we'll kind of have to exhibit a little bit of discipline here. Uh, unmute yourself, ask your question, and then mute again so, so Greg can respond. Um, you know, he has, he has a lot to say about his mom's experience. And I read the questions from those of you who submitted, and they're marvelous. And I, I hope that you will feel comfortable to ask some of those questions. Um, and maybe you might want to ask them exactly the same way you did. You wrote them out beforehand, or maybe some of what you've heard uh, makes you want to reshape them a little bit. Um, but why don't we see how that works right now? Um, Mitch, the, can, I, can I just add, Mitch, that it's, just to let everybody know, there's nothing that's out of bounds here, believe me. I mean, uh, you don't have to feel, um, you know, shy or, or hesitant uh, in asking about any, anything, really. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that I'd be very surprised if, if, uh, if you asked anything that, that, that would be offensive in any way. So don't hesitate to, to just speak your minds and, and ask any question you like. Okay, so the floor is open. I'll take the plunge first, <laughs> break the ice. Were you aware of your Jewish heritage or was some of the story, your mother's story, you think shielded to protect you? That's a really good question. And by the way, uh, Mitch, I don't know how you feel about it, but you know, even though we probably, I may forget it, I, I wouldn't, it'd be nice if uh, when people come on, if you like to, if you like to, if you want to, you don't have to, uh, you know, say who you are and if you want to or not. Again, um, I can see your David, but you know, um, anyway, it's anyway. To, to, add, to answer your question, David, uh, that's a good question that I that I get almost every time because it's a natural question. And and uh, uh, again, no, I was not aware of my my mother's history. Um, uh, she uh, she married. Um, my dad was from Virginia. Uh, grew up in a Roman Catholic home. He was a he was a child prodigy violinist. He went to, at a young age went to Juilliard when he was fourteen. Became a viola player. They met in New York after the war and were married, but um, he had, so I grew up in Indiana where he was, they both taught at Indiana University School of Music. And I grew up in a secular home and um, my dad was a, you know, a Catholic when he was growing up, a Roman Catholic. And, and my mother was, grew up in a, in a, in a home uh, in a, uh, she was proudly, proud of her Jewish heritage, but they were secular. They didn't go to, they didn't go to synagogue. And so I grew up in a in secular home. And the reason I mention that it's important is that the thing is, my mother, when I um, I didn't know anything about her story really until I was um, I knew she had come over. I had this obviously growing up in a small town in in, in Indiana. You know, I, she, she spoke Russian to me until I was until I was about five years old, and then I became self-conscious that, of course, nobody else on the block uh, spoke Russian, and their mothers are Russian, and so I asked her to stop, and she foolishly agreed, and so <laughs> I, I forgot it, um, except for the uh, few words. But, um, uh, but she, um, so no, I was not familiar with, this, with, this, with the story. And when years later, when I, did, when I did the book, finally, I asked her, I said, well, why didn't you ever tell me when we were growing up about the most, really the most important event, events of your life? And um, she, and my brother, my brother's five years younger than I am. And she had a really good, simple, I mean, it was a beautifully simple, uh, simple answer that I, I think any parent, even not anybody could understand. And she said, I just felt it was too cruel to tell young children about things like this. And I wanted you to have normal childhoods. And so that's why I didn't tell you. And you know, that is exactly, she achieved her goal. We had, you know, happy childhoods, you know, sort of leave it to beaver kind of um, a childhoods in the Midwest. I knew nothing about this. And it was, um, it was a great judgment on her part, a decision. Now, there are many Jewish families of the same uh, generation where the story of the Holocaust is an important part, an important part of, that, of that family's history. And I completely understand that, where it, it's something the children learn about when they're younger. And I think that that's really, that's understandable and that's important. 
but uh, in the, many of those cases, um, it would have been impossible to shield the, the children from those from that history, uh, from that history, because many of them grew up in in, uh, in places like New York or Chicago or Los Angeles in greater Jewish communities. They were families that went to synagogue, and it would have been impossible, I think, to to be religious, to be a, a, a Jewish, uh, a practicing Jew is what I'm trying to say, to go to synagogue without learning about the Holocaust, which is such an important part of, of Jewish history. So that, we didn't go to synagogue, and in the, there were very, very few Jews around as far as I know, so there was no way I was going to hear about it. So my mother was able to maintain through not telling us, through her not telling us the story, and also the fact that it was really just not in the air and um, in, uh, uh, in, in Bloomington, that able to maintain my bubble of innocence, you know, of, of this story for such a long time. Um, again, I was dimly aware of the fact that she was from Russia, but I had no clue as to what her experience during the war was until many years later. So no, it wasn't part of our, um, part of our history. Somebody else asked, I've been asked to ask another question that's connected to your question, David, which is, well, didn't you ever ask about your grandparents? Well, of course, my mother's parents, uh, of course, perished at uh, Dravitsky Yar. And I thought, you know, that's a really good question. I said, no, I never did ask my mother about her parents. And I thought, why would I not have done that? And I realized that because grandparents have probably are a lively presence in, in the lives of most of my friends, I think the only answer I have is that my, own, my dad's parents, his dad died when he was 12, and I barely ever knew my grandmother so, uh, and his, his mother. So I didn't have grandparents on either side, so the fact that my mother had never mentioned hers to me wasn't kind of conspicuous by absent and absence, and so I just never, I never really pursued it. Or maybe I was just a particularly clueless kid, just too obsessed with baseball or something, but, um, but it wasn't. And so uh, that's the way, I, that's the way uh, I grew up. One last thing I'll add about that is that, and this is something I discovered, uh, you know, only discovered uh, during my, after my book came out really, is that um, in the Jewish families that did share that story with their, chil with their children, uh, children my age, um, who are known as uh, second generation survivors, um, when they became, uh, when they became, uh, uh, many years later, uh, many of, they spawned a whole genre of literature, of memoirs, that, uh, that, uh, that told about the difficulty they had late in life, when I, I shouldn't say late in life, when they became teenagers, young people, and young adults. There were a lot of people from that cohort, the second generation survivors, who developed psychological and emotional problems they couldn't account for. And these were kids who grew up generally in middle-class homes, um, didn't, they were not, wasn't a matter of uh, being involved in, in, in drugs or anything. They were, these were normally adjusted high achieving kids in most cases who developed um, these emotional psychological problems they could not account for. They went, many of these, many of them went into therapy and what they discovered was that they were, it was delayed trauma and that they had been told these stories, uh, their parents' ex experiences uh, during, the, during the Holocaust. And that as young children, they'd done naturally, many of them had repressed, had repressed those stories because they're so horrible. And that, and that they stayed buried until they be started to mature and became teenagers and young adults, at which point they started percolating up. And so they became aware. And there's, and again, there's this whole subgenre of literature you can find from second generation survivors about having to deal with that trauma. So I never had to. And I, I think it's reasonable to think that one reason is my mother made that decision not to, you know, not to, not to tell us about that, uh, tell us about her experience. So I credit her with that. And uh, it doesn't mean it would have been the same thing in every instance, but for us, I think that that's, a, that's probably a good explanation as any as to why we were able to, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, avoid that uh, avoid that kind of trauma that so many others in our situation you know experience. Greg, I want to I want to just jump in and and say um, your experience with your mom is not entirely unique. Uh, 
uh, it's a little bit of a sub theme uh, that I've heard from from folks in the second generation who've said my parents didn't tell me at least at the level of the details that they later shared what happened maybe some of it was passage of time you know that, that people were a little more prepared to talk about these events um, when they got older but I've heard from a number of people that uh, that the Holocaust survivor told their story to their grandchildren in a way that they never told it to their children. Uh, so certainly that's not that's not unique to you, um, but your mom's experience uh, allowed her to hide probably a lot more uh, than maybe a lot of other people did uh, because of where she ended up living and um, the, the fact that uh, Bloomington, Indiana didn't have a large survivor community. No, I think you're you're exactly right, Mitch. And by the way, I would say that the same thing applies to just non-Jewish World War II veterans, uh, who have all, you know we're seeing more and more stories from from grandchildren and uh, who who have been the ones to get a a grandparent to speak for the first time about their experience in in the war. Uh, these are just a, you know. Uh, men who were soldiers in, in, in the army and, and maybe were, whatever their experience was during the war, whether it was Normandy or whether it was being, uh, helping to uh, liberate some of these death camps after the war, who just did not share those stories for many of the same reasons, probably their own trauma. And I think that you're exactly right. Uh, this would probably be a good point at which to tell the story because it's so relevant to this group of people who are here today is, how that came about for my mother, that, uh, that how it came about in this case, that really the key to, really the key to this book being written was, was, a, was a survivor, grandchild, granddaughter contact with, uh, between my mother and our daughter, Amy. Uh, Amy's, now, uh, Amy's now 38 and, um, uh, and just had a daughter, so we now have a third generation or fourth generation survivor in our granddaughter Felicity. But um, when Amy was in, uh, in middle school, Glen Ridge Middle, middle School in Winter Park uh, in 1994, it was, um, she had a wonderful, uh, a wonderful uh, history so, uh, social studies teacher named Ron Hartle, if that name is, rings a bell with anybody, Ron Hartle. And, uh, Ron was a really innovative, creative, passionate uh, teacher. May still be. I don't know if he's still teaching now or not, but marvelous teacher. And um, uh, one day he gave everybody in the class an assignment, uh, which is, I think, by now being pretty common and standard, is that he he asked the uh, the students to to write a story, do an interview with a uh, uh, with a with a grandparent um, about what their lives were like at the same age as they were, the student was. And so Amy came home um, with that assignment and told us about it and said, um, and of course, at that point, she only had one living grandparent, it was my mother, uh, who'd always been reluctant to talk about her story, as I said. So she said, well, I got this assignment and I'm going to write a letter to Z. She called her Z because my, uh, for short, my mother's name is uh, anglicized as Z-H-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, Jana. She called, always called her Z, and so she said, I'm going to write a letter to Z and ask her to uh, tell me her story. And Candy and I looked at each other, and we both thought, well, good luck with that. But we said, yeah, go ahead. great idea. Go ahead and write Z. But just remember, you know, we don't know whether she'll write back right away or not or something to that effect, because we really thought that my mother would probably demur, that she would maybe say something like, Amy, I'd rather not talk about that or something. Well, about two weeks later, um, much to our surprise, Amy got back a wonderful handwritten, um, wonderful handwritten letter, uh, several pages, big pages, from my mother detailing for the first time in very emotional, personal terms, her experience during the war and what happened to her and her family. And we were just amazed because even though my mother uh, had told me ultimately in the 70s sometimes the broad outlines of her story, she had never really talked about it in very personal, emotional terms. And it was, it was Amy's letter, her granddaughter's letter, that, that 
it got her to open up. And as you were saying, Mitch, this is, I think, a, we hear stories about this all the time where grandchildren have a special connection with their, with their, with their grandparents and that they can get them to talk about things that they probably wouldn't talk about with anyone else. And so that letter kind of unlocked my, my mother's memories and made her more willing to speak, not just to Amy, but to, to me about her experience. It led, it led a number of years later to the, the start of our research, my interviews, many, uh, many hours of interviews with my mother about her experience and to the writing of Hiding in the Spotlight. I, I d d don't think that the book ever would have happened except for that assignment from Mr. Hartle, Amy's letter to my mother in which uh, one great line from Amy, so she was so innocent, so ingenuous that she said, uh, Dear Z, I'd like to know what was going on with you uh, when you were my age. She said, were there any major world events that you remember? That, uh, and so, <laughs> and I knew there was at least one big one. So uh, uh, that, led to, that led to the letter, a much longer letter from my mother. And then again, uh, you can make a direct connection with, the dots between the between that and the writing of hiding in the spotlight so yes you're exactly right mitch and hopefully that's happening more and more um whenever we make a presentation uh, to students um we we always encourage them to talk to their grandparents and ask them about their lives sometimes that's sometimes grandparents are just waiting to be asked whether there's going to be a book or an assignment or anything sometimes they're just waiting to be asked because the, for different reasons, well, certainly that generation tended to be less effusive about their own personal experiences. And, um, and, and so I think that they need to be coaxed, they need to be asked uh, today. It's kind of different culture today is people, you know, are more open, want to tell their stories, but, uh, but not that generation so much. So yeah, there are probably many, who knows how many wonderful stories and personal histories they're still locked inside the memories of so many people who are just waiting to be asked by, by a grandchild about, uh, about that. Okay, Greg, um, I wanna take this opportunity to answer one quick history question very quickly, and then I'm going to kind of sum together several questions which are on a, a common theme from several different participants. Uh, one of the questions was, did, did Ukraine have a ghetto system? like the rest of Nazi-occupied Europe? And, and the answer to that is uh, there wasn't a ghetto system across all of occupied Europe. Western Europe really didn't have ghettos. Even Germany didn't have ghettos. Um, but the, um, there were some large cities in Western Ukraine um, where, where uh, some ghettos were established for a brief time. Uh, but one of the features of the Holocaust in far Eastern Europe is it didn't last as long as, as in other places. Uh, there were people who were, who were murdered by the Einsatzgruppen whose entire Holocaust experience was a matter of a few weeks from the time the German army entered to the time they were rounded up and killed. Um, so there was, in, in the far eastern part of Europe, there was killing, then some survivors in larger cities put into ghettos and then killing again. In Poland, for example, the ghettos came first and then the killing. Um, so it, it happened differently over time uh, and in different spaces. Uh, now, Greg, uh, several participants asked a question uh, about your mother experiencing something that we might call survivor guilt. Um, you know, did she feel bad that she had survived when others didn't? Or kind of to add to that, um, now that you look back at your childhood, can you see any behaviors of your mother that you might not have noticed back then, but now you can think that maybe they are related to the fact that she had survived the Holocaust? Well, that's a, that's, <laughs> that's a really good question. Let me just say briefly about the, the ghettos. You're correct, there, there were no ghettos as we think of them in, in Ukraine for sure. And the, your, the time, the, the, the time uh, schedule that you gave is correct. Like the, the, the Nazis invaded Haikov, Kharkov, Kharkov, where my mother lived, in October of 1941. They were gone by January after, I mean, that's how quickly it was. And of course, the big Warsaw Ghetto, which has been the subject of uh, many films and movies and books, uh, but that was in Poland, of course. But, um, 
uh, but, you know, the liberation of the, of the uh, not the liberation, but the Warsaw Ghetto, the, uh, uh, the extermination of the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto, that's still better known of that uh, in many, um, in many uh, museums in this country than what happened in Eastern, Eastern, in Ukraine, which I think is a, again, an example of how history is, has not been correctly gauged. But putting that aside, to get to your more interesting question about whether I, looking back, you know, that's a tricky question. Let me tell you why, because even growing up and especially looking back, I was aware that my mother was extremely, um, you know, she was an extremely forceful, I think in the book I said that even as a young child, she lived her life in the imperative, you know, and she was that way as an adult, I knew her. Uh, very passionate, I, the word fierce, I, I don't want to say, not fierce in a bad way, but fiercely passionate about her beliefs and her, her theories about piano. I'll tell you a funny story is that um, uh, when Candy and I were living in Bloomington in the, in the, in the 80s, um, Candy was working at a, uh, in a Mother's Day Out uh, with, a, with a number of women, and one of them uh, was speaking to her, just having a conversation about how she'd taken piano lessons. And, um, and, uh, and she mentioned that as a young girl, she had taken piano lessons with a, a Jana Dawson, and how, um, and what a formidable kind of scary person this was. <laughs> and Candy said, when Candy said, oh, Jana Dawson said, that's my mother-in-law. And she said, this woman's white face just like turned white. All the blood drained from her face. She said, that's your mother-in-law? So <laughs> I tell that story because, because that's the kind of person. She was also a wonderfully sweet person and beautiful and a fantastic pianist. So, so looking back on it, I see all those things in even heightened relief. But here's the thing. Almost all the Russians I've known have been like that. <laughs> so that's kind of that description of Russians. I mean, that's kind of their, that's their personality DNA. I don't want to overgeneralize, but again, the Russians I've known, they're all kind of like that. So I don't know to what extent, you know, the person I knew, my mother, I knew was, was how much of that was uh, a product of, of the, of the Holocaust and how much not. I will tell you one thing that that maybe casts a little bit of light on that possibly is that um, the man who would become my uncle, Larry Dawson, the one who was the ran the displaced persons camp in in uh, in uh, Germany after the war, where my mother and her sister Frina stayed for a number of months before coming to this country. Um, uh, that Larry um, sent the girls, uh, sent, the, sent the girls that were still, well, young women then, but when he put them on the boat to the coming to this country, he sent, um, he sent his brother, David, who became my father, um, a letter about them. Uh, he had sent them more than one, but he sent them a letter describing them. And he said, you know, you will find these girls remarkably uh, remarkably untouched by the brutality that they experienced and that they witnessed. And he said, they came out of this war, they said that they saw the, the darkest, most terrible things that humanity had to offer, and they came out of it, they came out of it uh, amazingly uh, intact, you put it better than that, emotionally. And, that, and I, I think that that is true, and I think that a lot of it had to do, this goes to the, uh, the subject of the book, really, goes to the fact that I think that that they were really insulated by their music, uh, not only in body but in soul during the during the uh, war. That because they were performing the music that they loved, that was connected to their parents who had perished, and that it insulated them against the the worst depredations of the of uh, emotional depredations of these horrible events going on around them about which, by the way, they were not entirely aware because they were really in a bubble. They didn't know what was happening, uh, uh, you know, uh, elsewhere in Europe as they were traveling across Europe with the Nazis, forced to. And so, uh, and, I, and one thing about my mother that's true is that it, growing up with her, 
I often heard anger from her when she would speak about these things, but I never heard bitterness. And there's a big importance, I think, importance, but difference between bitterness and, and anger. And so my mother could, be, could get tremendously angry about things, but no bitterness, which I think is remarkable because I think most people, you would understand if just about anybody would go through that experience and emerge quite bitter about their experience and it would taint the rest of their lives. And that never, I never found that to be the case with my mother. And, and I think it's why she was able, you know, again, I think the music had so much to do with that that it sustained her emotionally, it gave her a place to go emotionally, and that, and her music reflected that. She had, the word ebullient is still, I think of her, her, her personality and her music. And which is, and so if you, if you had met her on the street and uh, talked to her, she's not, you wouldn't think, wow, that person sounds like they might've been a Holocaust survivor. You would never get that from her. It just was not, uh, it just wasn't seen part of her emotional, um, persona ever. You know, Greg, um, on, on your website, um, Hiding in the Spotlight, uh, you included a, uh, a review uh, of one of your uh, mother's performances where the reviewer said, unlike a lot of modern pianists, she does all her emoting through the music. She didn't make, you know, broad gestures at the piano. Uh, she, she kept a very reserved manner of, of presentation, but the, the style, uh, but her performance itself was full of emotion. And I wonder if you think that that was also connected to the fact that she had to maintain uh, a very um, proper persona in order to, to pass herself off as not Jewish, and um and frina as well um so that you know she she could sort of split herself um the 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 very controlled person uh operating in the environment she was but able to put into the music everything she couldn't possibly uh express any other way well, well i think that's a really terrific question which only she could answer <laughs> because it's so nuanced, I think. And it's a really, really excellent um, question. And, and I think that I can tell you that my guess is that, is that what you saw there is more, just a guess, because I think what you're saying could well have been a contributing factor, but I think that most of it goes back to what was a classic Russian um, uh, piano instruction. You know, the Russians, had uh, had this amazing uh, system. The Soviets, the Russians had an amazing system for developing young talent, and 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 the Russian. Another word that comes to to mind about Russians is, even though tremendously passionate and they could be abusing, like they're also severe, and that the Russian school of piano instruction, which was developed by the by, in the Soviet Union and into what we would call today, of that magnet schools. Really, they would identify the the best, the best talent in the Soviet Union and give, give, bring them to special schools and give them special instruction. It was very formal, it was almost severe and, that, and it was classical. And that's, I remember my mother saying that, that, that even when she played the first time for the German soldiers after, who didn't know she was Jewish, an audience of 700 German soldiers in, in, uh, in, in, in the Ukraine, in the town that the Germans were occupying, that she came out 14 years old, 14, 15 years old to the stage to face all these, these German soldiers. And she didn't know really about the Holocaust per se, but she knew her parents had been murdered and she knew that terrible things were happening. Even then she came out and she bowed to the audience. She bowed to those soldiers. And I asked, I asked her why, and she said, because my father says you always bow to your audience. It didn't matter what the audience was. And that she, that was a matter for classical training. So I think that it's most likely a, a part of that tradition of, of Soviet and Russian piano instructions, that that was a, a formality and that was not to be skipped just because you didn't like the audience. But I really like your idea and, and I think it may well be part part of that, that she felt she needed to maintain uh, that level of, um, of emotional distance in a way, uh, 
um, to, just for own peace of mind. And also is wrapped up, that being wrapped up in part of the, that classical training is that you, it doesn't matter if you're 14 years old or, you know, or 60, that, that, that was the, that was, that was a, that was something that you always maintained as a, as a, as an artist. So Greg, um, the, um, there was a, a question in here that I'd like to jump in on. Um, they, it's from Sandy Stern, and she says, wasn't the Pale of Settlement the only place where Jews were allowed to live in Russia? And the answer to that is the Pale of Settlement was a creation of the 18th century, and so a lot of, in the Russian Empire period. So a lot of what was the Pale of Settlement in those days actually turns out to be, in later history, Poland, um, Ukraine, and the Baltic states. Uh, part of the Baltic states anyway, Belarusia as well. So, um, so that pale of settlement uh, is, is uh, kind of an older term, a, a very important term, um, but that describes an area where, where there was a, a large number of Jewish people living. And by the way, you could get small towns where Jews were the majority of the population, but there was no region uh, in the pale of settlement where Jews were the majority of a large area. Uh, they were always a smaller amount, and if you could use um, Poland as an example, uh, Jews represented, and, and most of what was Poland would be, the an older version would be part of the Pale of Settlement, uh, they might have represented 10% of the population, or, or in a high example, Warsaw, 30%, 33% of the population, uh, but when you compare that to Western Europe, Jews were less than 1% of the population in Germany. So, um, so you had a, a large enough Jewish population to be recognized. Uh, there was also one other thing I wanted to mention, Greg, and this is just for us as Americans. Um, it was as big a, a thing in, uh, in Russia for parents to try to get their kids uh, into uh, a conservatory to, to learn music and, and especially piano, as it is for a lot of Americans to get their kids into a quarterback camp or a tennis academy. Um, yeah, the parents have these dreams for their kids. And would you, would you spend a moment talking about your grandfather's musical dreams for his children? Uh, yes, and I would say that uh, you're exactly right about, the, about that. That's a, that's a great parallel between the, the Americans and but the Russians. One big difference is that it was the Soviet government that actually uh, put a lot of effort into developing uh, those kinds of camps and getting the kids to them. Um, I think one thing I said, one of the books is that the, uh, the Soviets were really lousy, it turns out, at agriculture, but they were really, really good at, at, at uh, classical culture, <laughs> much better at developing, much better at developing, uh, uh, you know, pianists than they were growing wheat. But anyway, the, um, uh, uh, but about the, um, about my grandfather's dreams for his daughter, it was quite simple. I mean, he was a amateur violinist. He was a candy maker by trade. He made uh, caramels mainly in his, in his home in big pots and on the stove in their, in the little home in uh, Verdiansk and would sell them in the bazaars. But uh, that was his, uh, that was his job. But his, he was an amateur violinist who would sometimes play in small ensembles that would provide the music for silent movies. There were Amer American silent movies would come to, uh, come to uh, her town. They would show them in the park on a big screen and he would be in the little orchestra, little ensemble that would provide the music. And he was an amateur violinist and that was really his life. Music really was his life and he wanted his daughters both to be, uh, to be uh, piano virtuosos. And uh, so uh, when they were, shortly after my mother was born, he bought a piano, uh, bought a piano for them, uh, for her. And ironically enough, it, it was one, it was a Beckstein, which he imported from Germany. And so she learned to play on a, on a German Beckstein piano. And, um, but she, but, but uh, from early childhood, that was his goal for them. My mother really didn't want to do this. She was a very adventurous kid. Even from the age of like three, three and a half, she would get up in the morning by herself, 
get dressed, go out and explore the town. And um, that's what she wanted to do. She did not want to play. She didn't want to take piano lessons, like most kids, yeah. So finally, she was just becoming such a, you know, uh, a wanderer at such a young age that they, they, they had to find a piano teacher to, to get her, please take her, you have to get her off the streets and they forced her to take piano. And so she started very reluctantly and then there was such great love for music in the home and she loved music. Every night she would go to sleep listening to her father and one of his friends uh, who's a pianist, they would, they would play. Uh, they would play many nights, most nights, and my mother would go to sleep in the living room li living, uh, listening to them play. And so when he started, when he forced her to take piano lessons, she said, well, why should I become a musician? I already have musicians around me. I can listen to them. That's, I don't need to learn myself. But that, of course, didn't fly. And so she did learn. And at age six, actually made her public debut on the radio, playing uh, Bach, uh, Bach on the radio there in, in a in, uh, in her hometown. Frina, her little sister came along. Um, she wanted to copy her big sister, of course. And um, she uh, also uh, st ultimately started taking lessons, uh, became a wonderful player, uh, artist on her own. And at a very young age, you're right, parents wanted, it was a big goal for them to get their, their kids into a conservatory. And my mother and Frina were accepted at ages eight and six. My mother was eight, Frina was six. And uh, they were the first children ever given scholarships at, at the conservatory in Haiku. And they, uh, the only, and the first young children that were ever taken by, their, by, the, by the man who taught them, a man named Professor Luntz. And so uh, that was uh, their father's, uh, that was their father's uh, grandest, design for them and which which their mother shared in for sure and um uh and that was all going as planned it was going wonderfully until those terrible days in 19 1941 and um one of the first things that happened uh when the germans came to town they went banging on all the jewish doors breaking in taking valuables and they came after the the father's violin and the day that the the nazis seized his violin was a really, really dark day for the entire family uh, because the violin, as my mother said, was like part of the family. And it wasn't too long until after that, some weeks later, that all the Jews in town were marched out and taken to the killing field. So uh, um, he would be, if you could somehow call up people who are gone, there's not a single person who would be happier, prouder of what became of them and were pleased that they had reached their not only survived but reached their musical destiny that he had that he had seen that he had seen for them. Greg, um, one of the teachers in our group, uh, James Uhusu, writes: um, Your mom hid her identity, but what motivated her to reveal her identity to the American soldier? Oh, really? That's that's uh, that's that's a good question. These are all really good questions, and a uh, kind of poignant one too. Um, the American soldier they revealed it to was Larry Dawson, the, the head of this camp, who ident who heard them playing one day. Yeah, they had a lot of time. They were in the camp for what month, number of months, six or eight months. I've forgotten what it was, and um, and uh, it was very boring. And after the war, war was over. They're waiting to be repatriated, or they didn't know where they were going, but. Um, one, they, one day they found an old piano in an abandoned hall somewhere and they started playing. He came along, he heard them play, he, became, he was enchanted. He loved classical music. He couldn't play a lick. Of course, his, his little brother, David, was a, was a prodigy, but Larry loved music. And so he, um, he decided, he decided, I'm gonna take these, I'm gonna bring these girls to America. That's my goal. And so, and so um, he approached them and they talked about this idea of going to America. And uh, he, he asked them again about their story. And uh, at some point, the story kind of broke down and they, had to, they kind of had to admit uh, to him what, that these were not their real names. And they, and they said, he said, well, what's the first thing that, what, what, what do you want now? What's the first thing that you want now that the war is over? And my mother said, we want our real names back. Because they had gone five years masquerading under non-Jewish names, which, which had been, 
uh, something they had to do, but it was something that was, it's interesting that I was surprised when I, when my mother told me the story that how, um, um, what a sorrow it was for them not to be able to keep their parents' names. And so the answer to Larry's question was, what's the first thing we want our, we want our net real names back. And so um, that they always wanted them back, but it wasn't possible until that point because, uh, because they were so used to, to concealing it, uh, their real names just for the uh, sake of their own survival. So that's why, they, that's, why, that's why and how they got them back. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, teachers, it reminds me of, a, of another very poignant story you might want to look up. Um, there was a, a survivor pretty well known named Gerda Weissman. Uh, her married name was Klein, so Gerda Weissman Klein. Uh, back in the 90s, she did an HBO special called One Survivor Remembers, and she recounted the experience of her liberation, uh, which uh, she was on a death march. and. The, um, the last night, the guards abandoned them, and in the morning when they woke up, they were in an abandoned bicycle factory and did not know the guards had fled. Um, Gerda peeked out the door and saw a Jeep coming up the road with a white star on the hood, uh, and it was then that she knew that they were free because the Jeep with the white star carried American soldiers. And... Um, the, one of the American soldiers came up to him and she knew nothing about him at that time. Um, he had been a, uh, a refugee from Germany to the United States. And so he asked her um, in German, do you speak German and in English, do you speak English? She didn't know English, but she was from the Western part of Poland and she did know German. So he, uh, she, she answered him in German and he asked her, um, you know, can you show me the other, the other prisoners, the other girls? Uh, this, this death march was all girls. And, um, and she said to him at that time, I have to tell you, she said with some hesitation, she said, I have to tell you, we're Jewish, you know. Uh, almost as if, you know, he would respond differently because he, you know, she said that. She was so used to, I think, being abused because she was Jewish, she felt like she had to reveal that to her liberator. So she said, I have to tell you, we're Jewish. And she said he was wearing sunglasses, so she couldn't see his eyes, but his response to her was, so am I. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so, so this might also not have been completely unique, uh, that it was a real moment for survivors who had hidden their identity or who met somebody new to either admit that they were Jewish or have to decide to continue to hide it, which, which some did. So I just thought you'd be interested in, in that story as well. Now, Greg, I, do, do with this next question what you want, um, but I think that uh, it, it deserves at least to be heard. Um, this is from Carolyn, and, um, and she writes, um, give me just one moment, uh, I think you said, your aunt, sorry, getting that on the screen right. Um, I think you said that your aunt survived. Oh, there we go. Your aunt survived the Holocaust. Did she and your mother remain close throughout their lives? Did your aunt tell her family about her experiences? Uh, I'm glad you asked that question because it always comes up. And, and the, uh, so the answer is that, of course, during the war, um, my mother and Frina were stayed together. Of course, they stuck together. Uh, they needed each other to survive. Um, there's some things in the book about it, in which uh, it shows that 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 they took turns saving each other's lives. I'll put it that way, in different ways. Um, but they were together, uh, of course, during the entire war. They came to this country. They both went to Juilliard uh, together, and. And then um, in 1949, um, my mother left Juilliard early to follow my father, who had been hired, uh, who had been hired, uh, he had been playing in the M NBC Symphony under uh, Toscanini, and he was offered a job in Indiana. And so 1949, left and went to, went to Bloomington. And after that, that's where I was born and grew up. And then over the years, um, 
over the years, you know, we used to, uh, Frina was married to a pianist, became married to a pianist. They had two sons and we used to see them when I was growing up occasionally. Uh, they uh, taught at a university, Ken, uh, Frina and her husband, Ken, uh, uh, taught at a university in Southern Illinois and we would see them. And then they went off to Buffalo where they were on the faculty at the SUNY Buffalo, uh, State University of New York at Buffalo for many years. And over the years, my mother and Frina had a, um, an increasingly, um, you know, increasingly flinty kind of relationship over myriad issues. And, and, um, and then um, finally, sometime in the 90s, about the 90s sometime, they became estranged from each other. And um, for all the reasons I can't, I just don't know. Um, I think some of it, honestly had to do with the fact that Frina, Frina was a wonderful person, a great artist and teacher, uh, chairman of the piano faculty at her university, but a very tempestuous person who always seemed to be, um, seemed to, to, to take a adversarial uh, stance to the world, whether it was members of the piano faculty or other people, and a fundamentally kind of tormented person. And I think it's because my armchair psycholo psychological uh, theory is that Frina, for various reasons I go into in the book some, um, was more uh, traumatized by the war than my mother was. And that she had a, a more fragile psyche than my mother. And I think that even though it was delayed, not immediately apparent after the war for some years, that she had psychological problems, some PTSD uh, that my mother never experienced. And that led, that was part, I think, of their ultimate estrangement and feuding. And and that was very, very sad because just because they've been through so much together. They had survived the Holocaust and they they both they came here, they both had good successful lives. And so it was a it was really, really painful when that happened. And so when I got to the point where I was gonna do the book, of course I knew the first the first thing I had to do was interview my mother and then interview Frina because it's her story too. And there would undoubtedly be things that she would remember that my mother didn't remember, or maybe she would remember the same things differently. In my background as a journalist, it just seemed to me that that was fundamentally something that was important to do, that to look at their versions and go back and ask more questions. Well, when I approached Frina, she declined and uh, to be interviewed. And of course I was surprised and disappointed. And I waited a while. And I wrote back to her and I asked, I said, you know, Frina, I hope you would reconsider. It's really, I really want to hear your, um, I really want to hear this from your point of view. This time her husband wrote back and said that Frina was very upset that I would ask again um, about what he called the most private moments of her life between her parents and herself, meaning her escape. So we don't really know how exactly how Frina escaped that death march we know about my mother and he said so she's it's very upsetting to Frina please don't ask again and so I didn't I wanted to respect uh, I would respect them so I, didn't, I never did ask again and Frina and my mother never were reconciled and Frina died about a year and a half ago um, uh, she had had progressively advanced dementia Ken had died mm, a year or two before that and and uh, so uh, uh, we made one final attempt. Actually, it was Candy's doing. She determined to get the sisters together one last time. We traveled to Buffalo uh, about four or five years ago and went to the assisted living home where Frida was living. And we went there and with my mother. Frida came out and she was just angry and didn't just didn't, didn't want to to see us, didn't want to see my mother. And it was a very, uh, it was a unsuccessful reunion, very sad. And we left and then, as I said, Frina died uh, about a year or two later. So yeah, it, that it was very tragic, the way it ended between them. And to this day, uh, we're not sure exactly how Frina escaped uh, that death march. Um, which is always one of the first questions that comes up. We've heard a couple of different versions from people who might be in a position to know, uh, nobody in the family. Here's the other thing, when Frina died, we were never notified by the family. It had a pretty large family in Buffalo. Uh, uh, 
you know, different nieces and nephews and two sons and nobody ever contacted us. Somebody outside the family notified me and said about it, told me about it. And I had to go online and find the obituary and um, in the Buffalo paper, the Freena had died. And there's not, interestingly, there's hardly anything in her obituary, really nothing about her wartime experience. It just says that she, something to the effect that she came to this country after the war, nothing about the Holocaust. And my mother's name doesn't appear until really virtually, literally the last line of the obituary, which says that, uh, that uh, Frina also had a sister, Jana. That's it. Nothing about their life together and what they had experienced. So that is strange, you know, and um, uh, a sign of really the sadly dysfunctional uh, relationship that developed over the years after they had been through so much. Okay, Greg, we have time for one more question. And um, I had asked teachers um, to think of questions they might want to ask you about your research. So I think we'll just take a very generic one here. What was the most difficult thing for you personally about your research or, or what you learned? Huh, okay, let me, let me think about that. Well, um, I would say that um, a couple of things. First of all, um, when I did the interviews with my mother, many hours of interviews, um, I just had her tell me the story. Didn't stop her along the way to check on anything. But when I went back, the first thing I did, and this is the first thing I did when I got the tapes transcribed, was to go back and check to see how accurate this information was. And so I, I was, thank goodness for the internet, I was able to go back and find authoritative sources. And I found that her memory was astoundingly good and that she remembered uh, specific, uh, she was connecting specific events with correct dates and time frames. It was really amazing how good her memory was. I might say this is part of the discipline required, the mental discipline required to become a pianist who plays at a, at a world level, you know, world-class level. Uh, tremendous amount of discipline, so I suppose I shouldn't be surprised, but I was. After all, it was many, many, many years later. She was, let's see, how old was she then? She was 80, so, so a little before. But, um, but anyway, that was, I went back and I, I did that checking and I found that she was amazingly accurate. Then the other thing is that it was, we had to have some luck here. Um, one question that usually comes up is, where do we get all those family pictures? Uh, because the family had had fled, had been marched out of the marched out of their their hometown without anything. They were they were allowed to take almost nothing. My mother did take, managed to, to to salvage and keep and 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 to preserve her favorite sheet music for fantasy impromptu, which somehow made it through <laughs> through a war zone for five years and made it to this country intact, which is a miracle in itself. But basically, the family. The family took nothing with them. They had no pictures. So the question is, where did those pictures come from? It turns out they were, su they were supplied by one of my mother's um, cousins, whose family, like many families in uh, their town, had, in, in Harkov, Harkov, had chosen to, to, to flee east to the Urals or, uh, in, or into Siberia ahead of the Nazis so that they would, they would they would fled east and stayed there until the end of the war. And then many of them after the war, in, instead of returning to Ukraine, um, went to, they emigrated to Israel. And this particular cousin's family had emigrated to Israel where she spent the rest of her life. And she had all these family photos. And we, uh, it's kind of a detailed story about how she got in touch with that cousin, but she did. Uh, the cousin got in touch with her learned about these photos and Candy and I went to Israel and interviewed uh, her and she gave us all these these priceless family pictures that really all the pictures that you see in, in the book or online all those pictures come from come from her so that was that was again we had to get lucky we had to get people who reached out um, who reached out to my mother this cousin by the way at some point had become aware that my mother had survived the Holocaust and was living in the U.S. and had tried repeatedly to 
to uh, get in touch with her. And she had actually found out exactly where my mother lived and what her phone number was. But every time that she would, every time she would call my mother and, and try to speak to her, she would speak Russian to her. And my mother would immediately hang up thinking it was a scam artist. And so on the umpteenth time that her cousin called, instead of speaking to her in Russian, she spoke to her in English. And my mother somehow responded, that somehow connected with her. She took that call and that's how she discovered that that cousin was still living. And then we made the trip to Israel to get that, that, uh, to get that, uh, to get those pictures and other, other information. So we were at the, we were at the mercy of a circumstance and luck a lot of the time, um, to get those kinds of elements for, for the book. Um, there were, there was enough information online for me to get the basic history. I needed a frame, a contextual frame, of course, and give enough history of the events in which to tell my mother's story. Um, um, and so, um, there was enough history like that. I was, it wasn't too hard to get that. It was a bit time consuming to, 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 to double check it, but it was all there. The follow-up book I did, Judgment Before Nuremberg, involved much, much more research. Many trips to the library and uh, looking in different places for different things. But for this, but for hiding in the spotlight, it was primarily my mother's story, which I tried to and did confirm in all the ways I described, plus the great fortune of, of getting these pictures, these photos from the, from the surviving cousin. Um, well, Greg, uh, I want to thank you so much. It's hard to believe that it's 2.30 already. Um, I think almost all of us probably have to agree, all of us have to agree uh, that we could listen to you for, for many, many more hours. Um, you know, teachers, we had originally planned for this to be a face-to-face -face event at the Holocaust Center. It would have been from one o'clock to five o'clock, and we just didn't think that we could do a, an online meeting for four hours. But now I think you can probably see uh, that we could easily have been in the room with Greg for those four hours. Uh, I don't know if all of you can see, but this is me clapping for you, Greg, um, because I think this was a, a fantastic experience. Um, teachers, well, thank you um, to all, your, to all right. the for your great for your great uh, questions that you that you contributed and uh it's always just it's always as i said at the outset it's always great to to to, to speak to and i tell this story again uh for for another audience and uh, uh i was just lucky that this story fell in my lap you know and um and i've had the great privilege and the honor of telling it and having people like mitch who have been so important in helping to further spread the story really and um i've always loved all the times we've had at the at the center mitch hope we get to do it again maybe when the new one opens up right then i believe so yes um you know i'm i for one am going to be delighted when we can go back to face-to-face -face meetings uh, i'm glad we were able to figure out this way to do it um teachers if you have any questions that you want to uh, forward on to greg please feel free to send them through me um if any of the questions that you sent in uh, you didn't get answered to your satisfaction, just shoot me an email, tell me that, and I'll forward them on to Greg and we'll, we'll get your, your answer back to you. Uh, I'm not going to take much more of your time except to say this. Um, the, there is a follow-up activity that we're going to need from teachers to complete participation in the PD. I will explain it in, in much greater detail in an email that I'm going to send out to you, uh, but I'll give you the quick synopsis right now. Um, we are going to need from, from each person who is wanting the, the stipend, the book, and the in-service credit to send us either, now this is not, nobody has to do all of this, either a lesson plan that you would use in your classroom to teach about this story. And if you do a complete lesson plan, please make sure it includes um, standards and benchmarks and, and um, the kinds of things you put in a lesson plan, like how you would scaffold the lesson and differentiated instruction and things like that. Um, but when it comes to describe the activities with the students, you'll need to give us just a tiny little thumbnail of what you would do. Now, if you don't want to do a full lesson plan, that's great. If you want to just focus on the activities you would do as students, 
You can write those out and describe them, but do it then in more detail. Um, describe the, the actual student activities um, in, in more detail. And if you would prefer to do something other than those two things, that neither one really um, is, is uh, enthusing you, uh, then just send me an email and tell me that you, what you'd rather do, uh, because I'm open-minded on this. We will need a product for everyone um, to, to complete your participation in the PD. Uh, but I'm looking forward to seeing them. If they are of the same depth as the questions that you sent, uh, then I think that it's going to be a wonderful experience for me to see everything that you submitted. Um, and, and one thing I will do, uh, but I will only do this by permission. Um, if you would like to share what you send in to me with other teachers, I will create a Google Drive account and post what you let me post and make it open to everybody in our cohort, everybody in this who, who participated in this PD. Now, that's not a requirement. If you don't want to share what you are doing, that's completely fine. But if you're willing to and you want to receive from others, just let me know. I'll make that Google Drive folder available to everyone. Um, Mitch, one last thing I'd like to throw in there um, is that one thing teachers to keep in mind, if when, you get, when you're teaching your, your Holocaust courses, if you think it would be helpful, if you'd be interested, as I said, Candy and I have done countless um, presentations at schools. We love doing schools. And if you think that it would be helpful or interesting for your students to, 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 to see a presentation from us, um, just let us know. And uh, because